Welcome back to Coriam. I'm Brian Gaberti, and today we're joined by Dr. Stacy Frisch. Dr. Frisch completed her residency at SUNY Downstate and her med ed fellowship at Maimonides. She is now assistant professor in emergency medicine here at NYU and associate program director of a residency program. Great to have you on the podcast, Stacy. Thanks so much, Brian. It's great to be here. Today, we're going to talk about a relatively common chief complaint that comes to our doors, vaginal bleeding in the first trimester. And this is one of those situations where in the emergency department, we play an important role in ensuring that the patient is safe and we can have a significant psychosocial impact through our counseling. So Stacy, can you start us off with how we are defining threatened abortion, how common it is, and what are some things that you immediately look for when these patients come in? Absolutely. The reason that I wanted to focus on this topic today is really because it's such a common chief complaint in the emergency department, and it's one where our presence and our counseling can have a profound impact on the patient. Threatened abortion is abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding during pregnancy before 20 weeks with a closed cervical os and without passage of fetal tissue. It happens in about 20 to 25% of all pregnancies. Whenever we encounter these patients, your first thought should be, are they stable or are they not stable, sick or not sick? If they're unstable, you're going to be making very quick decisions to place large bore IVs, obtain type and screens, possibly emergently transfuse blood or initiate an MTP, and you're going to be doing a fast on these patients. You're looking for free fluid in the abdomen that could indicate a ruptured ectopic, and if you find that, or if the patient is unstable, you're going to be calling your OBGYN colleagues for definitive management. For the patients who are stable, though, we have a bit more time to suss out what's going on. Yeah, certainly. And one of the common threads that runs through our shifts is the importance of approaching cases with a broad differential and including more life-threatening diagnoses like ruptured ectopic. So the lower abdominal pain with or without bleeding differential is a long list. And to make things even more difficult, our typical imaging modalities like CT are not the preferred options in these patients. As is usually the case, we are going to have to rely on a robust history and detailed exam to guide our next steps. So Stacy, tell us about what you pay particular attention to when you gather a history from these patients. It's important on your history to obtain key information like the OB history, including any history of prior ectopics, the quantity of blood loss and whether there are any symptoms of anemia, the passage of tissue, and any history of prior ultrasounds for this pregnancy. Pay particular attention to the characteristics of the abdominal pain and any associated symptoms, because pregnancy does not magically make you unsusceptible to other intra-abdominal infections and emergencies. It's important to still consider your usual abdominal pain differential, like appendicitis and cholecystitis, for example. Okay, so we've gathered our history. I have a patient who, as an example, is hemodynamically stable with mild cramping, spotting, 12 weeks by dates with no prior ultrasound, no significant mucopurulent discharge, and the os is closed. Walk us through your diagnostic approach for these patients. For these patients, you're going to rely on a mix of abdominal exam, labs, and ultrasound imaging. Your lab work is going to include an RH status, a beta HCG level, a urinalysis, and maybe a CBC and a type and screen if there are concerns for heavy bleeding or anemia. Now, to touch on RH, if the patient is RH negative, consider if Rogam should be administered to prevent sensitization of the mother and hemolytic anemia of the fetus in subsequent pregnancies. While this certainly seems to be useful in antepartum bleeding in the second and third trimesters, evidence on whether to give Rogam or not in the first trimester is less robust, with some organizations like the WHO recommending against giving Rogam at less than 12 weeks. ACOG has deferred giving guidance on this management point, and I'll quote the ACOG Bulletin from 2017 on this topic. Quote, whether to administer anti-de-immune globulin to a patient with threatened pregnancy loss and a live embryo or fetus at or before 12 weeks of gestation is controversial, and no evidence-based recommendation can be made. End quote. Okay, so that's RH. A lot to consider. Stacy, let's move on to the other tests that you're getting and how they're directing your management. Your CBC with the hemoglobin and the hematocrit can help you monitor the degree of blood loss, but if the bleeding is minimal and there's no concern for anemia based on the history and the physical exam, you don't necessarily need to obtain them. If you think that the patient might need a blood transfusion, though, make sure that you send a type and screen as well. A urinalysis is going to help you screen for UTI as well as asymptomatic bacteria, and a low threshold should be used to treat these patients in pregnancy. Beta-HCG is one that's a bit more tricky and needs to be interpreted with caution. A one-time HCG measurement does not discriminate between an ectopic pregnancy, a healthy intrauterine pregnancy, or a failing IUP. It can, though, be useful when you compare it to repeat beta-HCG levels that can be drawn in follow-up. Yes, and while we're talking about beta-HCG, an important lab factoid is that the numbers arrived at through serial dilutions if the beta-HCG is ultimately high. This is why a negative beta will result way before one of 70,000, for example. However, if you call the lab, they can tell you if it's prelim positive and they're undergoing serial dilution so you could get an idea earlier on if the patient's pregnant or not. Now, this is such an important test in the workup here. 
Stacey, can you discuss how else we use this value and specifically outline the beta HCG discriminatory zones? We're taught about these cutoffs for beta HCG above which you should see signs of an IUP on ultrasound. And these cutoffs specifically are 1,500 international units per ml for a transvaginal sano and 3,000 for a transabdominal sano. But unfortunately, ectopic pregnancies don't follow these rules. So if the beta HCG is below 1,500, you still need to obtain an ultrasound to rule out an ectopic pregnancy. If you obtain pushback from your radiologist or a consultant and they tell you that there's no point of performing an ultrasound if the beta HCG is below the discriminatory zone, you can let them know that you're looking for evidence of an ectopic or for a large amount of free fluid because ectopics can occur and can rupture at any beta HCG level. And speaking of ultrasounds, Brian, are you doing your own ultrasounds or are you sending these patients to radiology? I certainly perform bedside transabdominal ultrasounds with the hopes of finding an intrauterine pregnancy with fetal heart rate or at the very least a yolk sac. And this doesn't mean that I won't rely later on on a radiology or OBGYN colleagues for a more official study. The more information I can get, especially earlier on, the better. And certainly, as we said before, a FAST can be helpful in identifying free fluid in the abdomen, which can be suggestive of a ruptured ectopic in the appropriate scenario. Now, let's discuss one of the most impactful roles that we can play in the emergency department when it comes to these cases, how we deliver the news, how we frame this for patients, and how we review the important components of counseling in patients with threatened abortions. It can really be a pivotal moment for the patient, and for some people, it might be the first time that they're discovering that they're pregnant. It's important not to assume that all of these pregnant patients want to be pregnant. Discuss the diagnosis transparently and don't sugarcoat the facts. 50% of patients with threatened abortions progress to pregnancy loss, so it's important that the patient understands that there is an elevated risk. Beyond the medical aspect, there is often this undercurrent of guilt and shame. It's crucial to dispel any misconception that the patient is at fault. Most spontaneous abortions result from chromosomal abnormalities that are beyond anyone's control. And let's not forget the potential for intimate partner violence during pregnancy. Abuse might begin or escalate in this vulnerable time. Mental health is equally delicate, and screening for depression, psychosis, and suicidal ideations is crucial. Absolutely. In these moments, our role extends beyond just medical. We're here to provide support, to dispel myths, and to address the broader emotional and social implications. It's about compassionate care at every aspect of the patient's journey. Now, pivoting the discussion, a common question from the patient that can arise in these cases is if there's any activity restrictions. What recommendations are you making at the time of discharge, Stacey? Bed rest and activity restrictions are actually not recommended because they don't prevent any progression to spontaneous abortion, and they do increase the risk of venous thromboembolic phenomena. Many clinicians also tell patients to avoid sex, but there's actually no good evidence to support that sex or even orgasm decreases the chances of having a completed abortion. Yes, and don't forget standard pregnancy guidelines, which include avoiding smoking, alcohol, and drug use, as well as beginning prenatal vitamins. Good point. Brian, what kind of follow-up do you give for these patients? In general, stable patients with a threatened abortion should be managed expectantly without any medical or surgical interventions. They will need to follow up with OBGYN for serial ultrasounds and beta-HCG measurements to confirm whether they have a viable IUP in a topic or whether they are progressing to an inevitable, incomplete, or complete abortion. But these patients need really strict return precautions. I always tell patients to come back if they have heavy bleeding, severe abdominal pain, fever, feeling unsafe at home, or if they feel like things are not going in the right direction. I find it's important to give numbers to actually quantify what heavy bleeding means because that can mean different things to different patients. I tell patients to come back if they're saturating more than one pad or one tampon per hour for two hours. Great. Thank you, Stacey, for sharing your valuable insight on threatened abortion today. Let's wrap it up with some take-home points. Threatened abortion is defined as vaginal bleeding during early pregnancy, characterized by a closed cervical os and ultrasonographic evidence of an IUP. In these cases, it's important to assess patients' hemodynamic stability promptly, though it's rare that a patient will require blood if threatened abortion is the ultimate diagnosis. Keep your differential broad in these cases. Vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy could be from a threatened abortion, which should be viewed as a diagnosis of exclusion, or it could also be from more threatening pathology, like a ruptured ectopic. Understand that Rogam certainly has a role in second trimester vaginal bleeding in the RH-negative patient, and that there is a dearth of good data on its role in the first trimester. It'll ultimately be a decision that is made by you, OBGYN, and the patient. Approach the interpretation of HCG levels with caution, and remember that ectopic pregnancies might not adhere to conventional HCG levels. Established follow-up and discharge instructions are crucial. Stable patients should be managed expectantly with established OBGYN follow-up for repeat beta HCG and ultrasounds when appropriate, and clearly outline when the patient should return to the emergency room. 
Finally, we play an important role where we have to ensure the patient is medically stable and psychosocially safe. Here, compassionate communication is vital when discussing what the diagnosis might entail, alleviate any feelings of blame or shame, and remain vigilant for signs of intimate partner violence or mental health issues. As emergency medicine physicians, it's crucial for us to approach these cases with a comprehensive mindset. Okay, that'll complete our episode. Dr. Frisch, it was great having you in the studio. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. 